Stay hungry, stay foolish. Every human is born with multifarious potential. Why then do parents, schools and employers insist that we restrict our many talents and interests, that we specialize in just one? We've been sold a myth that to specialize is the only way to pursue truth, identity or even a livelihood. Specialization is nothing but an outdated system that fosters ignorance, exploitation and disillusionment. Following a series of exchanges with the world's greatest historians, futurists, philosophers and scientists, our guest today has weaved together a narrative of history and a vision for the future that seeks to disrupt this prevailing system of unwarranted hyper-specialization. In The Polymath, our guest shows us that there is another way of thinking and being. Through an approach that is both philosophical and practical, he sets out a cognitive journey towards reclaiming the innate polymathic state. Going further, he proposes nothing less than a cultural revolution in our education and professional structures, whereby everybody is encouraged to express themselves in multiple ways and fulfill their many-sided potential. Not only does this enhance individual fulfillment, but in doing so facilitates a conscious and creative society that is both highly motivated and well equipped to address the complexity of the 21st century challenges. We welcome author of The Polymath, Unlocking the Power of Human Versatility, Wakas Ahmed. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed, Aidan, for having me. You were telling me off air that since you've written this book, many, many people have come to you and feel that it makes sense of who you are and the desire to be versatile and to reinvent yourself time and time again. It'd be great to hear a bit of that before we get into the book. Absolutely. Yeah. People have approached me having read the book or even just read about the book and have kind of given a sigh of relief because I guess for the first time or one of the first times, this kind of mode of being, of learning, of working has been validated in some way. A lot of people are in a state of disillusionment, confusion, because ultimately, every single human being is naturally, inherently multifaceted. And to then create a society where humans are then encouraged or actually compelled to pigeonhole themselves into one particular type of learning or one particular career uh, is going against that human nature. And so it suppresses an innate desire to express oneself in many ways. Before we get into the book itself, it'd be great to give a definition of what a polymath is for those of our audience who don't know. It's an interesting question because a polymath has been defined in so many different ways in recent history and, in fact, in early modern history. And a polymath, of course, a poly being many, math being knowledge or learning. Now, this has been defined as an individual who is of great or varied learning, according to many dictionaries. It's also been defined as people that excel in multiple fields or disciplines. Now, what I saw was a big bias on the one side towards people of great learning, i.e. scholars or academics. So it's sort of intellectual polymathy on the one hand. And then on the other hand, a kind of loose use of the term polymath as someone who either has different variety of skills or excelled in many professions, thoughts, arts, and so on. So I kind of sought to bring these two elements together, the thinking and the doing, I guess. And the way I define the polymath, therefore, is someone who more generally is exceptionally versatile and therefore excels in multiple seemingly unrelated fields. Now, I say seemingly because most polymaths you'd meet or that you'd read talk about different fields as if they were all part of a unifying framework, or at the very least, talk about multiple fields as if they are connected in some way. They themselves don't see these fields as disparate or as unrelated, given the society we live in that segments and segregates different fields and disciplines. That's how it is viewed. And you tell us that being a polymath 
dates back to the dawn of man because we needed to be polymath. It'd be great to look a little bit at the evolution of polymathy throughout time. For this, I spoke to a variety of historians, ancient historians, early sapien historians, one of which, for example, is a renowned and respected world historian, Felipe Fernandez Armesto, author of many books, including Millennium and The History of Ideas. He was very clear that there was no such thing as polymathy or non-polymathy in those times because every human being had to face the circumstances that they were in. Often they were challenging, they were sometimes hostile, and in order to do that, they needed to use any skill that they had or acquire any knowledge that was necessary in order to survive and indeed live a decent life. We often think the um, primordial man as being a survivor, but actually many of these societies, these traditional societies that even exist today and give us a glimpse into early man and early society, were actually highly interesting in that they had different aspects to their society, whether it be music and entertainment, whether it be art, whether it be other forms of recreation, as well as hunting. Hunting, for example, was seen as a ritualistic and recreational endeavor in as much as it was a necessary one for for survival. So yes, early man or woman had to be exceptionally versatile and there was no system of dividing labor or dividing people into different types that would have served different functions. Everybody could be and indeed was everything they could be in order to contribute towards their own survival as well as towards the thriving of their particular tribe or society. And one of the things you call out in the book when you do look back over history is that there's a male bias and also that most polymaths recorded in history tend to be white European elites because they're the people who often wrote the books. But it'd be great to share some of the early polymaths maybe that our audience may recognize, but not recognize as polymaths, but more for one specialization that they had. Yeah, all of what you said is absolutely correct. There has been a male bias, but that male bias is not just about the history of polymaths. It's concerning history in general. We know that. Similarly, the Eurocentric view of history is the predominant one, still is. And as a result, we have certain historical narratives or the majority of historical narratives reflect that. Similarly, with a variety of other biases that we still hold and how that manifests in history. Now, in terms of the book, The Polymath, I made a purposeful effort to diversify my investigation into polymathy and into polymaths by looking at polymaths from different parts of the world. Most, I guess, historical narratives or even popular history books today do try to pick an example or two from other parts of the world. By other, I mean non-European or non-American, non-Anglo-Saxon. And that sort of kind of serves their purpose in terms of making it a little bit diverse. But the way I saw it was that that, that that kind of cherry picking or tokenism, it doesn't suffice in providing an accurate view of this, of the history of polymathy. So I traveled extensively over the course of about five years and I read books of history and philosophy, spoke to people from different parts of the world to get different perspectives and to understand how the polymath manifested in their society, in their culture. So me, myself, I, I'm from a very diverse background, so this almost comes naturally to me, but we don't often see it in books today. So I think this, for me, if there is an achievement in this book, it's definitely a reflection, a more global reflection of that historical narrative. One I thought that people may not have heard of is Ecuador's Eugenio Espejo. Yes, Eugenio Espejo is one of them, but actually what one would find is that the polymaths that are recorded most, I suppose, from, I guess, the colonies or from other parts of the world are those that were in some way part of the elite of that country, but also had a tremendous social or scientific impact. So Eugenio Steckel was one of them in the sense that he excelled in, so, in a variety of fields, including history, law, science, and so on. 
but he was also an activist, an anti-imperial activist, whose activism manifested in poetry as well as journalism. You see that actually across the world. Jose Rizal is another example in the Philippines, who actually was probably the youngest example of a polymath I give in the book, because he, he died at 35, I believe. And he was a lawyer, as well as a physician, but somebody who's also expressed himself through a variety of different artworks and poetry as well. And his novel is known as one of the great novels coming out of the Philippines of that time. And he himself was killed by Spanish colonists because he was part of the anti-colonial struggle as well. And so this, again, is one of the many themes that emerge from the book, which is that a lot of the polymaths from other parts of the world were involved in activism in some way or another. Yeah, and you say that many, many polymaths throughout time made a transformational difference in the world. They made a huge impact. And some more well-known people that people may not know as polymaths are Lewis Carroll, for example, the author of Children's Stories, and Edwin Hubble. I'd love if you shared a little bit about these. Yeah, these are great examples because they demonstrate exactly what you said, that when we look back in history, we see people for one particular accomplishment in a particular field, and we assume that they were lifelong novelists or lifelong scientists. But Lewis Carroll, as we know, was not that. Lewis Carroll was actually not called Lewis Carroll. He was, that's a pseudonym. He was actually called Charles Dodson. He had a very interesting case in that he was actually a mathematician who started off as a clergyman. And he was a mathematician and logician who also invented a number of sort of mathematical problems in the form of games as well. But interestingly with him, he was also one of the leading photographers of his time. He photographed a number of very high profile, I guess, celebrities of his age, and they became famous depictions of those people. Uh, But he himself, as we know, engaged in writing a lot of fiction, the most famous of which was Alice in Wonderland, for which we know him. But how many people know about these various other facets of him that I've just described? Similarly with Edwin Hubble, he's known because his name is given to the Hubble telescope and because he was indeed a groundbreaking astronomer. But he had an incredibly diverse background himself. He has a background in law, in sports. He was a Spanish teacher. He was a basketball coach. He was a linguist. He was many things before he actually made his scientific discoveries. These are two examples, but there are many, many over history. And in fact, I would argue an even bolder claim, which is that any so-called specialist that we might think of throughout history, let us look a bit deeper into their lives, which we often don't. And you will find, more often than not, an incredibly diverse range of at least interest, if not accomplishment. This is something you talk about is actually what are those traits. And for example, it's the interconnectedness of things. And by studying one field, you often spot analogies or different ways of thinking about the other field. But as you said, the polymath themselves sees them as totally interconnected. But if we're too specialized, we don't. We have the blinkers on. It's quite a simple concept to grasp, actually. Like if you have only one pool of information or one source of inspiration, then it's going to be limited. Whereas if you have access to multiple pools of information or inspiration, then not only are you going to potentially make contributions to various fields, but you will also see that your own core field is part of a much bigger picture. And in order to be creative or innovative in your core field, it requires you to, as we know, think out of the box. Now, thinking out of the box is something we pay lip service to, and it's almost a cliche now in creative discourse. But actually, thinking out of the box connotes that you are in a box in the first place. So I'm challenging why we ought to be in that box, and indeed, we ought to reside in multiple boxes, or actually, why have a box at all? I love that. One more before we go into some of the traits and some of the ways we need to look at this to change it in the future is Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale is a great example because she's a woman and we need many of those examples today because there are unfortunately very few women in polymath history. 
Number one, they don't exist as much because of what you mentioned earlier, which is that much of history was written by men, for men, and to the exclusion of women, because that's how society was run for much of human history, although not all. But also because, yes, women themselves, although they had a tremendous propensity to be polymaths, often couldn't be because they were restricted either intellectually or socially or professionally because of the society they lived in in that time. So those that we do hear of that did accomplish in a field were only allowed, I guess, to accomplish in that one field. And Florence Nightingale, who you mentioned, is one of the exceptions to that rule, at least in sort of Victorian England. We know Florence Nightingale for her accomplishments in medicine and as a nurse and her humanitarian work in setting up nursing schools and so on. But actually, she was originally a mathematician and statistician who made tremendous contributions to the way statistics was visually expressed in the form of various diagrams. So that's one thing. But also, she wrote on so many other things, including on medicine and on theology. And this, again, is something that's lesser known. If you look at the complete works of Florence Nightingale, you will understand, which is a multi-volume set of books, you will realize the sheer versatility and the diversity of her thought. Yeah, and there's so many great examples. I think you've covered every polymath there ever was that you could get, <laughs> uh, get the history on. I don't think great. I've scratched the surface, to be honest, but I, at, least, at, least, at least what I've done is to demonstrate a very particular point, which is that polymaths did exist in different parts of the world at different points in history, and that those that we traditionally consider to be so-called specialists were actually polymaths. There's one more that I have to say, because I love the quote. John F. Kennedy was celebrating a famous White House meal, yeah. and he had all these Nobel laureates, etc. there. And he said, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent of human knowledge that has ever gathered together in the White House, with the exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Yeah, yeah that, that joke must have gone down very well, because Thomas Jefferson's multi-talentedness was famous amongst various people, especially Nobel laureates at the time. I want to make a point about Nobel Prize winning scientists in a second because it's related to this. But um, going back to Jefferson, he himself embodied the original founding father spirit of the polymath, which another polymath, Benjamin Franklin, is also a part of. But talking about Jefferson particularly, he was very interesting because he, of course, did have a background in the law, which many politicians do, but also he also invented a variety of things, which I won't go into now, but he was also an agriculturalist who also spoke multiple languages. There are multiple dimensions to this man, and he wasn't alone. If you look at many of the founding fathers, including Benjamin Franklin, you'll find that they were all sort of multifaceted characters who then came together for a very, very particular political cause. And you find this often across human history. Jefferson is a good example. I want to talk about, as you were mentioning, the Nobel laureates. I wanted to mention a very interesting point. According to a study by American psychologist Bernice Edison, titled the Sigma Psi Survey, based on testimonials by numerous Nobel laureates, most great scientists often have multiple avocational interests. In-depth analysis of Nobel laureates in literature between 1901 and 2002 found that great artists and writers often have multiple avocational interests outside of the lab. He found that the science laureates were highly accomplished outside of the lab. More than half had at least one artistic avocation and almost all had an enduring hobby from chess to insect collecting. One quarter were musicians, and 18% practiced visual arts, such as drawing or painting. These laureates are 25 times as likely as the average scientist to sing, dance, or act, 17 times as likely to be a visual artist, 12 times more likely to write poetry and literature, eight times more likely to do woodworking or some other craft, four times as likely to be a musician and twice as likely to be a photographer. 
this is an important point because when anyone talks about specialization being necessary for ultimate accomplishment, well, one of the ways in which ultimate accomplishment in science is recognized is through the Nobel Prize for various sciences. But this study demonstrates how actually, if you look into the lives of those scientists, many of them had a variety of other interests, even careers, even hobbies, and some of them even attributed their success in their core discipline to the diversity of their background, right? So Einstein, for instance, being one example of somebody that attributed his breakthroughs in physics, his alternate modes of thinking derived from music because he was a violinist. He said he often thought in music. So it gave him a different, it sounds romantic, but if you spoke to, or if you got it from Einstein, I'm sure he would give you a much more interesting answer. <laughs> but the, the, the reality is that the truth of the matter seems to be that these guys and gals had multiple sources of inspiration. They weren't just stuck in their lab or in their study, micro-focusing on one particular thing their entire lives, and all of a sudden, a creative breakthrough came through. No, the creative breakthroughs came through multiple perspectives that they must have gained, not only through their lives, but through their hobbies and prior careers. And this is a really important concept that goes throughout the book. And you go as far as to tell us about biology and neurobiology and how the brain is formed, etc. But I loved one particular quote, which is from yep. psychiatrist and philosopher Ian McGilchrist, which says, the left provides the knowledge about the parts, while the right provides the wisdom of the whole. And it's this idea of whole brain thinking. Yeah, whole brain thinking is tremendously important and something we have forgotten, or at least we are not aware of. This is important because Ian McGilchrist himself, who is a philosopher, a psychiatrist, as well as someone who has a background in English literature, actually. So he's quite polymathic in his own thinking. And if you read his book called The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, that book is based on this idea that the individuals or societies focus on using different hemispheres of the brain manifested in a particular society and a particular culture, depending on which paradigm of history we're looking at. So he'll talk about, for example, the most creative and innovative periods of Western history, the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, or the Antiquity, as being periods where there was a strong focus on right brain thinking. Right brain thinking, as you mentioned, being a more holistic type of thinking, whereby people are more conscious of peripheral as well as specific areas of any inquiry and that they they are more intuitive and therefore perhaps more creative in how they view things whereas the left hemisphere of the brain is known to be more linear more logical more thoughtful more rational which has of course has its benefits but an over focus on the left creates a system or a culture of hyper-specialization simply because it encourages reductive thinking and looking at things in a more Cartesian way, i.e. through um, looking at each phenomena in separate building blocks, as opposed to looking at things as connected to one another, which is more right brain thinking. So whole brain thinking, which effectively utilizes and leverages these different modes of being and thinking in a way that optimizes thinking in general, I think is the way to go. And I think this is where a lot of research is being done and can ought to continue being done because if we're going to try to optimize creativity and innovation, I think we need to understand where that's traditionally come from, what type of thinking and brain activity that's associated with so that we can then encourage that through society. And this is such an important point for innovation and the problem in so many companies is the company is run with the left brain. And even to the extent that even in these big consultancies that consult other business on how they should proceed in the future, in this uncertain future, this period of unbelievably rapid change, mm. they're being consulted with the left brain. And in those companies themselves that are doing the consulting, it's run by the left brain because they have to do 100% billable time or as much billable time as possible. So there's even no time for the consultants to activate the right brain. They don't have time to enjoy their hobbies or read or 
read a blog or read a study or read your book, for example, and actually mm. activate the right brain. And this is one of the problems that we see in business time and time again in this age of disruption. You know, this is a very important point, and we should go back to Ian McGilchrist when discussing it, because he talks about a particular myth, which is the myth of focus or attention. So focus and attention traditionally for survival has been seen as a complete and utter exclusive focus and attention at the expense of all peripheral activity or factors, right? That has its use from time to time, but that's become the norm. Whereas what he's suggesting is that real attention and real focus ought to be a bit more holistic. And I think he gives the example, it's on the RSA website as an RSA animate, and people should go and check that out. I'm sure he articulates it much better. But just to paraphrase and to summarize, he talks about how when an animal, a bird, for example, is approaching some type of food, they will stop and they will pay attention to that food and they will seek to consume it. But at the same time, their attention must be 360 degrees. It must be holistic in the sense that they must also simultaneously look out for uh, predators. They must also simultaneously look out for mates. They must also simultaneously look out for their family and so on. So attention and survival-based attention ought to be much more holistic than we currently say it to be. So yeah, I, I absolutely, when, we, when we're taking that sort of analogy to the corporate sphere, there is a particular, I would call it a myth surrounding survival, specialization, competition, whereas people think that is best achieved through hyper-specialization because that enhances efficiency. Now, let's move beyond post-industrialization efficiency model and let's move into a more creativity and innovation-based model. What that means is that are we going to be focusing on exclusively on output, output and productivity, or are we going to be focusing on new ideas and solutions to big problems? I think the 21st century would be focused on the latter because we've moved past the industrial age. And so if we're going to focus on the latter, we need to find a different way of not just thinking, but a different way of organizing our companies, our businesses, our societies, our governments, and indeed our own selves, our own minds. You tell us how we got here. You talk about how society, education, business, and even parents encourage the cult of specialization. But one that I thought was really interesting is throughout many, many countries, through many, many cultures, it's built into the language, this idea of jack of all trades, master of none. It's throughout so many cultures that you covered. It'd be great to share that because this is how we, we ended up where we are today. And this is one of the examples. This is one of the reasons that I have mentioned so many different successful polymaths in the book to defy this whole idea that a jack of all trades is a master of none. Why is it that so many people throughout history have excelled in multiple fields, have indeed excelled in their core field because of their diverse background, interests, passions? Why is it that they've been able to do so? They're not superhuman. In fact, many of them come from adverse circumstances. The archetype of the polymath, in, at least in the Western mind, is Leonardo da Vinci. But Leonardo da Vinci came from very adverse circumstances, poverty, he was left-handed, he was said to be homosexual, he was vegetarian, he was in some ways anti-establishment. Why is it that he was able to thrive in the way that he did, in the multiple disciplines that he did? Why is it that many of the others mentioned in the book are able to do so? We have to ask that question. Also, we have to ask the question of whether that notion is valid in the 21st century. This is moving on to an important topic, which is the future of work. In the workplace, will the specialist who has spent their entire educational life and vocational life focusing on one micro specialist area of concern, will they survive for one, two, three, five, ten years in that micro specialism? Because we know that rapid changes are taking place in the workplace, including things like automation driven by artificial intelligence and the likes. And with that, the so-called specialist or micro-specialist 
who's hoarding all of this information and specialism may be stripped of that very, very quickly. And so they would need to reinvent themselves. Now, what I suggest is instead of reacting, being proactive, equipping oneself with a variety of skills, different types of knowledge, and also the main core competency of versatility, which is what my book subtitle is, which is Unlocking the Power of Human Versatility. If you're able to train and indeed bring to the fore this competency of versatility, then you'll be able to adapt to different environments. And it's interesting us mentioning this because one very popular book or two books, I guess, written by an author called uh, Yuval Noah Harari. One was called Sapiens and the other was called Homo Deus. One was a world history. The other one was kind of glimpse into futurist trends. He's often asked, what are the lessons for the 21st century? And indeed, he's written a book on the lessons, 21 lessons for the 21st century. And one of the core lessons he mentioned is reinvention. Reinvention for the very reasons that we've been discussing. And so if we're going to reinvent ourselves, this whole concept of jack of all trades, master of none, will cease to be a derogatory statement and will actually start becoming complementary. Because actually you won't become a master of none, you'll become a master of versatility, which you can apply in a variety of ways. We're moving towards a gig economy as well. You need to be able to stand on your own feet, be able to grow business, build business, distribute market yourself to deliver the work build human relationships and i love this contrast between human general intelligence and artificial general intelligence because we're not mm -hmm. at agi yet but we're at ai and ai mm -hmm. does one thing really really well that means the specialist who has ironically is specialized to get paid more than anybody else is actually mm -hmm. the most at risk in a world of artificial intelligence moving on to education yeah. You say the curriculum was designed to produce factory laborers to read instruction manuals at most. And this is where education came from. But we're still there, unfortunately. We are. Unfortunately, we are largely still there. Now, we have to think about what the purpose of education actually was and now ought to be. It was during or just after the Industrial Revolution. Mass education was introduced, not because all of a sudden the leaders who were providing it, wanted to emancipate, intellectually and socially emancipate people so that they can think for themselves and create opportunities for themselves. The sole purpose was in order to serve the factory-based industrial model in order to increase efficiency. That's factory setting. I can't say doesn't exist. It still does exist to a large extent in a different guise. But now we haven't moved on from this whole idea of segmentation of knowledge in schools, for example. So you have different subjects or disciplines that are separated from one another, packaged up, and then thrown at kids in the form of lessons so that they might sort of understand and pass their exams. Well, to what extent is that knowledge cemented in the long-term memory so as to nurture that individual? I would say to a very limited extent. And the reason for that is that these subjects and this knowledge is not given any unifying framework by the educational establishment. What that means is that the student is not able to understand what, I don't know, the history of art during the times of ancient Egypt vis-a-vis -vis the biochemistry associated with the brain. What do these aspects of knowledge mean to them? What do they mean to them? And what insights does it give them about the world at large? How do these two or three or four or six subjects relate to one another so as to give me collectively, give me a better understanding of the world and to equip me to move out into the world, into the job market, into further education and so on? So I think we are still stuck in that paradigm, and I'm not alone in thinking that. I interviewed Sir Ken Robinson, who's got this very popular, I think the most popular TED Talk, who speaks about how schools are killing creativity in this way. And so if we want creative minds to emerge from our educational establishments, we need to start encouraging them to think openly, critically, and creatively about how this knowledge ought to be used, synthesized, and optimized. 
and parents also have such a large responsibility here. And I know that feels unfair because parents act in the best interests of their children, but the world is changing hugely. And regarding education, you remind us as children, we were all more cognitively flexible. And you tell us multi-talented children are often being faced with what psychologists refer to as multi-potentiality, a condition of frustration, confusion and anxiety suffered by multi-talented pupils as a result of the compulsion to specialize too early. This is a major problem. In terms of parents, this is a good point. What parents often do is they have a notion of what they think is best for the child. As you correctly said, in most cases at least, they are thinking in the best interest of the child. But their idea of what the best interest would be is a reflection of what is told to them by popular culture, by their own educational experience, by the kind of job market that they experience. I think what parents need to do is to take seriously what the future of work would look like, how that child is going to be best equipped in order to nurture their own minds so as to be able to enrich their lives. And enriching their lives includes work. And so therefore, work and the future of work ought to be considered very carefully as well. But I think when it comes to the polymath, as we discussed at the very beginning, human nature is multifaceted. Human nature is multidimensional. So we need to understand, parents need to understand that this multifacetedness has to be allowed to express itself. And this is why we do, or many people do, or many parents do, indeed like to expose their children to different things, whether it be sports, arts, and so on and so forth, in order to give their child a more rounded education, but also to explore what the child might be good at or might be passionate about. It's a kind of a, a period of trial and error and investigation, I suppose. That ought not to stop when you get into GCSEs and A-levels and degree level in this country at least, why does it have to be that pyramid education system where everybody is funneled off into one particular field and be expected to know their vocation by the time they're 18 years old? I mean, this is preposterous. This is almost unprecedented. You, of course, push into different fields, so you might be interested in something at one stage of your life, but that by no means means that's what you're going to be interested in and indeed good at later on in life. I mean, even those of us that are in our you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s will unlock different interests at different stages of our lives. There are many cases that I mentioned throughout the book where one of the polymaths who excelled in two other disciplines early on in life all of a sudden found another discipline in their 60s which they became a world expert in. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore is a good example from India, who is a poet, philosopher, musician, who later in the 60s discovered that he was also a world-class painter. And Paul Newman is another example, who uh, you know, was a businessman, actor, filmmaker, and so on, and in his 70s became a racing car champion. So in order for parents to encourage their children to explore their many facets, they need to firstly understand that it is possible for individuals to do things in multiple spheres throughout their lives. Yeah, and you mentioned that idea of the best thing to do is let children have exposure to different disciplines or different opportunities. And I often think of it as the idea of the lean startup or agile development, where the first thing you do is get a product to market and then learn from yep. how the user uses it. And it's the same thing. You can't create a theory of education and study for four years, then go into the workplace and kind of go, okay, now you're set for the rest of your life. You almost have to try different disciplines. And I always say to people, I lecture in Trinity College here in Dublin, and I tell the kids, mm. the, well, the adults, um, show, just showing my age there, what, what <laughs> um, so I tell the guys that you need to get out there and experience, do work experience, do an unpaid internship. If you need to try it out, try before you buy, because when you commit, it's going to be difficult for you to change. Because yeah. the other problem with polymathy is that when you do go and change, people frown upon you or you feel they're going to kind of go, ah. Oh, Aiden's all over the place. He's changed career or now he's in a different realm or a different domain of expertise. And that's not possible in culture. And this is why I think 
your book is so important. This is why starting this narrative about polymathy and that it's normal and that it's baked into humanity is so important. But regarding the future, I'm quoted an element from the book here. I love this. And you say, today we are entering a new paradigm of complexity, which is so true. That requires a shift in thought from the disproportionate focus on the left to a complete mind, which uses both hemispheres synergistically and synchronistically. Importantly, we need an education system, a professional environment and a prevailing culture that effectively fosters this. And we've covered education there and culture to an extent, but you mentioned the professional environment and this is important as well. And I'd love to finish on this because many of the listeners of this show work in professional environments that may be very left brain focused. Yeah. Yeah. I think in terms of professional environments, let's stay away from the uh, neuroscientific metaphors and realities for a second, because it's easy to fall into the whole idea of right brain and left brain thinking. I think let's think about professions or people's professional lives in a bit more realistic, grounded manner. And that would be, in your professional life, are you fulfilled with your job or your current vocation? If you are, what about it is allowing you to be fulfilled? And how can you optimize and continue and sustain that? But if you're not, which by lo- by many people's estimations is the case for the most of the people in the world, because of course, as we know, most people in the world are not choosing their jobs because it's what they're most passionate about and what they feel they're born to do, but because circumstances, for one reason or another, have placed them into that job or that vocation, and they're trying to make the best of it. It's allowing them to pay their bills or pay their way through life, but at the same time, it may, to some degree, be allowing them to feel a sense of purpose. I would suggest that both employees and employers take a different approach to this. A big thing at the moment for employers is employee engagement. Now, in order to engage your employees, you would need to understand how employees are generally fulfilled and self-actualized. I would suggest self-actualization is only possible when human beings are allowed to flourish in their entirety, not just in one particular facet. And it's not just me. Abraham Maslow was the one who spoke about this originally. He talked about man or woman should be all they can be in order to reach the epitome of self-actualization. So... What can an employer do to foster that? Because if they foster that, then it will only positively benefit their employees' productivity, creativity, and contribution to their organization or their team. So one of the ways of doing that is to recognize that each person is multifaceted. They probably have other interests, hobbies, ambitions, and so on. Is to try and see, okay, how can those hobbies, interests, ambitions align with our organization as a whole, our organizational vision. Can we help? And therefore, can our investment into those other interests bear fruit in some way? So I think they need to think about, the employers need to think about that. Employees need to develop a plan whereby they know that their job or could be their business, could be their portfolio career, as you mentioned earlier, could be any of these things. Does it provide them that opportunity to flourish in multiple ways and express themselves in multiple ways. And there might be a job that is polymathic in nature. There's a section in the book called polymathic professions. Polymathic professions are those that are inherently multidimensional, i.e. give you the platform in order to explore and contribute to different fields and maybe learn about new things in order to enhance your ability to perform in your profession or in your job. Or alternatively, you could be someone who actually excels in a career, but then stops after five years, 10 years, three years, whatever it might be, in order to completely change your career trajectory into a different field and then do a five-year, 10-year stint there to the level that you feel comfortable. These are what I would call serial career changes. They would change careers, not just split between different careers, but make a meaningful contribution to that career so that they allow that career 
to develop them, and they also make a meaningful contribution to that project or that company or that organization as well. That would be career changes. And then going back to what we said earlier, which is portfolio careers or indeed businesses, you would have multiple projects happening simultaneously that require different forms of knowledge and different cognitive skills. But nonetheless, you brought them all together in recognition of the fact that they are a reflection of what you can contribute to and therefore what you can gain from. So polymathic professions, serial careers or career changes and portfolio careers are three common routes for the polymaths in the modern workplace. It's so true that not every profession is going to provide you the purpose that you're looking for. Not everyone's going to be absolutely fulfilling. No job has every part of it that you absolutely love doing. No matter if you're a writer, you have to edit and all these type of things, mm. some difficult parts of every job. You just got to soak those up. But you can find purpose, like jobs can fuel the purpose. We had a guest on the show recently, Heather MacArthur, and she said that if the job doesn't provide you with a purpose, see it as fueling your purpose. It's giving you the money in order that you can do your purpose and then carve out places to do that. And one thing I'd love to say is this, you call this out in the book as well. And many people say this to me because I do the show as a passion and I yeah. write like you and I lecture as well as my day job. And I do spend time with my family. I'm home with my family 6 p.m. every day, except if I'm traveling. But the thing that everybody always says is, where do you get the time? You must never see your family. And mm. as you say in the book, you make the time. It's what you give up. I don't watch Netflix. I don't do many things. I don't go to the pub or whatever it might be. And yeah. I'm not saying there are bad things to do, but I just make the choice. Are there no good so, Irish pubs in Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> it's about making the sacrifice. So it's yeah, about making the choice and yeah. prioritizing what is important to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, family is an important thing. In fact, people often talk about intellectual or academic fields or professional fields as being the only valid strings to your bow if you're a polymath. But if you were able to lead a successful family life where you're contributing emotionally, financially, however it might be, to your family and you are contributing to their success and their development their stability, and you're giving that time, leading that family life can also be a tremendous accomplishment. And there's no reason why that can't be added as a string to your bow as a polymath, because it also requires emotional intelligence, it requires cognitive skill, it requires various forms of knowledge. So we should we definitely should not ignore that. Beautiful. And Wakas, a final word. So you say in the book that in the past, we've experienced cognitive revolutions. At one stage, there was five versions of man coexisting at one stage. Yeah. And we're witnessing another one. We're experiencing another one here. I agree with you. And I wonder sometimes the rise in cases of autism and ADHD. And this is this mm. signals of a change in cognitive revolution. And you talk about this in the book. It would be great to share this before we wrap it up. Yeah, the cognitive revolution that, that I was referring to was one where, as we spoke of earlier, there is a whole brain thinking that is encouraged by educational institutions, by parents, and then by employers. And even, you, can, you might say, by families and spouses, because after all, your spouse has a tremendous influence on you, often more than your employer, your parents, and everyone else put together. So it's important that you're on the same level as those people around you and those people that are influencing your life and that they are encouraging you to be a certain way. Now, whole brain thinking is essentially the ability to reach an optimal level of cognitive development. And the reason why that's important is because we are tremendously suboptimal and we're using a fraction of our capability. People often say, what is the difference? And I'm sure you've had this discourse with many of your other interviewees, is that what unique value does the human mind have vis-a-vis -vis super intelligence machines and artificial intelligence? Well, we don't know that is the answer, simply because we don't know what the human mind is capable of. We have no idea what the human mind is capable of yet. We get glimpses 
of the genius that we see in the accomplishments and the creative output of scientists, artists, business leaders, so on and so forth. But just imagine you had a whole generation of individuals who were trained to think critically, creatively, openly, and could understand things like complexity, interconnection, who had a more holistic, multifaceted, rounded way of being, and therefore thought and behaved very differently. Now, do we even have one or a group of such people, let alone everyone in the world, thinking in this way? We don't. And if we did, what would that do? What kind of revolution would take place? That is the cognitive revolution I'm speaking of. The reason why that's important in the context of polymathy is because the polymath is probably the closest we'd come to such a holistic, multidimensional mind because they are using their mind in a kind of optimal way. So it would be very interesting to see if this potential which has been locked up for a long time, if this is collectively, even individually and then collectively, unleashed, what would that look like? And would it be a revolution like no other in the history of humanity? Yes, I think so. Fantastic way to finish. Wakas, where can people find out more about you, your work, the book, etc.? The book on Twitter, at The Polymath Book. The-polymath.com is the book website. A new website that's coming up which I won't mention now, but the Twitter is Da Vinci Network. So it's at Da Vinci Network. So this is a wider movement that I'm generating in order to promote the narrative we spoke of earlier on, which is so needed, and to reassure so many people that it's okay to be on this track. It's okay to almost come out as a polymath or as an aspiring polymath. If you have specific projects that you would like to collaborate on after having seen my background and so on, you can contact me via LinkedIn, drop me a line. I was one of those people, I have to say, where I read the book and I didn't feel so strange or an outlier. And I'm sure many of our listeners will as well, Wakas. Wakas Ahmed, the author of The Polymath, Unlocking the Power of Human Versatility. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aidan.